my YouTube channel where I share all sorts of creative ways to bring your ideas to life with technology. This is my next video in my drones and STEM education series. You can check out all the other videos that I have in this series and my drones and STEM education playlist. I will have a few videos coming out each week over the next couple of months. So I hope that you will subscribe to my channel and subscribe to the playlist so that you will get all of the updates. In today's video, what I want to do is discuss the things that you need to consider when you are interested in bringing drones into your classroom or drones into a STEM education program. The first thing you're going to want to do is determine if your school or your district has a drone policy to begin with. So some schools do have drone policies already in place that you will need to become familiar with. So some schools also have no drone policy in place. So you'll need to just check with you know, your, your administration, check, check within the district to make sure that there is no policy against using drones in your classroom. So there's gonna be some things that you're gonna to wanna to consider around liability insurance and some other you know, sort of legal things that you wanna consider. So make sure that you're just checking with the right people before you decide to bring drones into your STEM education program. The next thing to consider is is to consider your budget. So what kind of financial resources do you have to purchase a set of drones? So if you have a small budget where you've got, you know, a couple thousand dollars where you can purchase a set of drones, that's great. But maybe you've only got a couple of hundred dollars and you can only purchase one or two drones or three drones. So you want to really look at what is the, what are the resources that you have available to be able to purchase a drone or drones and how many students do you want to have in your class or in your program? Number four is the big thing that I really think you need to consider when you are looking at bringing drones into a STEM education program. And that is to really truly understand the FAA regulations. So this is going to be pertinent for anyone who lives in the United States. If you live outside of the United States, you're going to want to check with the governing body who governs your airspace system. And so the FAA governs the airspace system in the United States. So that even includes if you are in your backyard or if you're in uh, your school's playground and you're flying your drone 10 feet above the ground, the FAA governs that space. So you wanna make sure that you are following all of the pertinent regulations around our national airspace system. So what I always suggest is to go right to the source, go right to the horse's mouth and get the information that you need. So in this case, you're gonna to wanna to go to the FAA's website to find all of the information you're going to need with regards to bringing drones into an educational program. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna dive into my computer. I'm gonna show you through the FAA's website, show you a couple of resources to get you started. You can read through everything. So let's dive in. All right, so here we are on the FAA's website. What I have done to find this website, it's linked in the description box in the notes. Um, but if you can't remember how to find this site, just go to Google, type in FAA educational use of drones, and this page will come right up. So you can see here that I'm on the FAA's website. I'm on FAA.gov. You always wanna make sure that you are on the right site. Okay, so uh, you know I'm recording this September 2019, things might change in the future. So if you're watching this at a later date, make sure that you're just looking at the most up-to-date and current information straight from the source. And the source here is the FAA. So I've brought up the site here for you to see, and you can see uh, that the title of the site is Educational Users. So that's obviously going to be us and what we're looking for here. You can also look on the left-hand side where it says Educational Users. That's going to just, that's your menu. That's just gonna show you that you're in the right spot. So what I'm going to do here is scroll down. We have two different options. So you want to look at what are your different options for using drones for educational use? So the, the first question here is, do you use drones in your classroom or do you run a drone training program? So that's probably a yes if you're watching this video. So to fly drones for educational or instructional purposes, so if you're teaching a STEM class or some sort of drone training program, there are two different options. So this is also gonna apply like if you're teaching an after-school program, 
you're um, running a community sort of program, it's a community outreach program, that kind of thing, that's gonna apply for you here because it's educational use of the drones. So the first one is to fly under part 107. So part 107 is the governing set of rules that is for flying drones that are less than 55 pounds in the United States. If you are not in the United States, this does not apply to you. And you'll get, you will need to look up the uh, airspace rules for your country, whatever the governing body is of your country. If you're not sure, you can look up ICAO, it's I-C-A-O, um, and they will be able to point you in the right direction for your, com for your country. So this is the set of rules for flying small drones less than 55 pounds in the United States. It's important to note that that does not include drones that are 55 pounds or more. It's less than 55 pounds. So part 107 is that just overarching set of rules for flying uh, as a remote pilot. So that's the official term by the FAA is the remote pilot. So you can fly under part 107. So under these set of rules for any reason, including work or business for fun in your backyard um, to teach or for public safety missions. So there are three different things that you need to know to fly under part 107. So the first thing is, is to make sure that you understand what is allowed and what is not allowed under part 107. So essentially when you're flying under part 107, you want to take a look at whether or not you are flying for hire. So is it part of your job? Is it part of your work? Is it part of your business? Is it part of what you're doing to earn a living? Um, so that's really going to help define if you're flying for hire or if you are flying for more of a recreational. This is a hobby. That's something I go do on the weekends and go tool around, right? So learn the rules. Make sure you understand what's allowed and what's not allowed. I click on this PDF here. It comes right up for me. So here it is. So you're going to want to read through this. It's got a lot of really great information. As of this recording here, it is, um, let's see, this was done on June 21st, 2016. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you are looking at this, you know, after June 21st, 2016, you want to make sure that you are looking at the right one. So again, it's September 2019. This is still the most current one. So you're going to want to read through all of these different operational limitations. So that's what's very important. All right. So after you view that document to go over the operating limitations for part 107, you can come back to this page and look at step number two that says become an FAA certified drone pilot by passing the knowledge test. So in order to uh, ha have your part 107 certification through the FAA, uh, you need to pass a knowledge exam. And this essentially shows that you know the rules of the sky, you know how to be safe, you know how to uh, read aviation weather sources, you understand the effect of weather on aircraft performance, all sorts of different things. There are a lot of questions on that exam about how to read navigation charts so that it, uh, they can ensure that you understand the national airspace system and where it is okay and not okay to fly your drone. So let's go through the steps. The first step here is that you, uh, to be eligible to get your remote pilot certificate, you must be at least 16 years old. You must be able to read, write, speak, and understand English. And you must be in physical and mental condition to safely fly a UAS or unmanned aircraft system. So, you can review this document here. It's the full process to get your remote pilot certificate. I'm going to go ahead and click on that for you. And it goes through the same eligibility requirements, but adds here that you need to pass the initial aeronautical knowledge exam. Um, and then also your knowledge ex exam is valid for two years. And you must pass a recurrent knowledge test every two years. And you must also carry the uh, certificate itself with you during all UAS operations. So the first thing is, is, it has step one here is to schedule an appointment. I really truly think that step one is to actually study for the exam. And uh, I will be sharing some resources for you for that, some free resources on how to study for that exam. The FAA does publish a lot of really good information um, to help you uh, learn more and be, uh, be confident and be uh, a safe drone pilot. So step number one, I think, is to study for the exam. So FAA says step number one is to schedule an appointment with a knowledge testing center. You can click that link right here. Uh, it's right here. And 
that will bring you to a page that will allow you to find a testing center that is nearby you. And you do need to bring a government issued photo ID to your test. It does need to be an, uh, an ID that has your home address on it. Step number two is to pass the aeronautical knowledge test itself. And it's the initial aeronautical knowledge test and knowledge test topic areas can include any one of these things listed here. So things like applicable regulations relating to small unmanned aircraft systems, including privileges, limitations, flight operations, airspace, airspace classification and operating requirements. So this one is uh, a heavy hitter on the exam. Uh, the FAA really wants to ensure that you understand the national airspace system. Things like aviation weather, small unmanned aircraft loading and performance, emergency procedures, crew resource management, how to communicate on the radio, determining the performance of your small unmanned aircraft, the physiological effects of drugs and alcohol, aeronautical decision-making and judgment, airport operations, and then maintenance and pre-flight inspections. So when you're done uh, passing that exam, you right here, so you've scheduled the test, you've passed your test, you so once you've passed your test, then what you'll do is you will complete FAA form 8710-13, that is for remote pilot certificate, and you will complete that in IACRA, which is the electronic system where we put in all of our uh, airman information. It stands for Integrated Airman Certificate and or Rating Application System. So you will create an account there and you will input your exam. The next thing you will need to do is to register your drone with the FAA. The registration costs $5. It's valid for three years. You need a credit or debit card and then make a model of your drone handy in order to register. And you're going to register here on dronezone.faa.gov. And so this is the site here where you will register your drone. Now you do need to understand that not every drone needs to be registered. So you need to determine if your drone needs to be registered. I'm not gonna go over that in this video. And finally, what you'll want to do is to mark your drone with your registration number in case it gets lost or stolen. So you always wanna make sure that somebody can return it to you should you lose your drone. Then if you scroll down further on the page, you have option two here is to fly as a recreational flyer um, as part of a modeler community-based organization. I'm not gonna go over that today because simply because I wanted to share with you what some of the requirements are for flying your drone if it's part of your job. So if it's part of what you're doing for, um, for hire. So I'll go over this in a separate video, but I just wanted to go over the requirements to fly under part 107 for educational users. So the national airspace system can be a little bit confusing, especially if you're just getting started with aviation, you're just, you're brand new to this world. So I will be having some follow-up videos to help describe this, to help you understand it a little bit more. I also have a Drones and STEM Education Facebook community where you can post questions. I have pilots in there. I have drone pilots in there. I have educators in there. I have all sorts of different people with different backgrounds that can answer your questions. So I urge you to join that community. You can click on the link in the description box to find that community and I will see you there. As always, if you found this video helpful, I urge you to like and subscribe to my channel. This will help you make sure that you get the quickest notifications of updates to the channel. I will be posting several drone education uh, videos in the upcoming weeks and months. So if you subscribe to the channel, you'll get those first notifications. And also please share this video with somebody who you think might be interested in learning more about drones in STEM education.